So I would echo, um, thanks for staying here. It's Friday afternoon and you're um, thoroughly engaged. I can see that <laughs> on the edge of your seats. Um, but thanks for being here. It's, it's a long day, so it shows your dedication. I've been a principal for almost 14 years, and, um, and I'm a storyteller, so I'm going to start with a story. The other night I came home, <clears throat> excuse me, and my son said, Dad, I, I have a homework assignment. I have to read these old books. And so I said, well, what, which old books are we talking about? So the list is very thorough, and it includes things like uh, Great Expectations and Pride and Prejudice, White Fang, uh, the Island of Dr. Moreau, and there's about 15 others. And so I said, well, come up with me to the office. And so I pulled out several books, and I brought one, for example, The Best of Jack London. And he looked at it and looked at several others. And finally, he looked at me and said, I'll just download something. <laughs> and I said, download what? And he said, one of these books. I'll, I'll download White Fang. And I said, it's right here. It, it's, why download it? It's, it's a book. It's right here. And he didn't quite get that concept. <clears throat> so I, he actually chose Old Man in the Sea, which is uh, one of my favorite. But it's the age right now that we're in. And that's really what this is about, engagement. The 21st century learner, what a great um, day for primary sources and, and other pieces. We're also in a very scary time with budget cuts. And so the gist of my talk really is as librarians, teacher librarians, um, even university people, this is the time, the perfect time, to take a stance and step up and get quality integration going with your classroom teachers to prove that you are invaluable to the system. Um, so, with that, um, a new story. In about 2003, 2004, the movie came out, Miracle, and um, I mentioned my son. We watched this movie, and what started as a dream um, grew into a reality um, because we watched it over and over <laughs> and over and over. And if you'll notice, He's got these little target rollerblades. His ankles are turned out. And um, he was about five or six at this point. And his reality became um, one of Herbrook's skaters. And so in the street, these, these rollerblades lasted about a day, maybe. And then they were worn to pieces. Um, and it grew into a passion. And this is him. Oh, a year or two ago in um, Cleveland. He was an MVP of a tournament. Um, and he's, it's my presentation, so I can brag about my kid all I want. So, um, but truly, it's grown into a passion, and, and he's nonstop. He's also identified in gifted education, and so he's quite bright, a 4.0 student, and yet he doesn't like school. His mother, um, works for the Colorado Department of Ed and is one of the regional directors for gifted education. And I, of course, am a principal of one of the top schools in the entire nation that happens to be a magnet school for gifted ed and accelerated and ac advanced academics. He's doomed because we're going to make him be a really well-rounded child. Where are we going with this? Well, again, I'd mentioned earlier this is the time where the 21st century and the integration um, of what we do has got to step forward even more. We're at a, a point where our students um, are very much learning the exact opposite of what we ever uh, went through. And we as principals don't allow. We don't allow technology. We don't, we don't want cell phones in the classroom. And yet, there's incredible lessons where the kids actually use their cell phones. You've probably seen the YouTube video, Changing Education Paradigms by Sir Ken Robinson. If you haven't, I encourage you to watch it. 
Um, we were fortunate um, Wednesday to listen to him. He was across the street, literally, and spoke at a legacy foundation. But in this paradigm, he talks about the aesthetic child. And when you think of aesthetics, the Buell Theater, concerts, you think of things that stimulate your mind and engage your heart. Passion. The passion. I'd ask that you think, are your students passionate right now? If they're not, why not? The theory is because we are doing a great deal of anesthetic instruction. We bore kids. We don't engage them. We teach them things that they certainly need to know by standards, but we don't challenge them in engaging ways. Why? There's lots of research out that by the time a child is eight years old, they've lost 100% of their creativity. Isn't that sad? And then we wonder why we have a challenge of behavior in our classrooms. We have a challenge of, maybe it's a medication issue. I ask us as educators to find the right path to teach with and for the 21st century. In its day, the Model T was incredible. In its day. But eventually, we improved it and went faster, had color to where we are now. But guess what? We need to be ready to prepare them for this. Because that's probably what's going to happen in the near future. So those of us who are still here, we should be aiming for this. Quick analogy. When you leave this incredible building and, and this beautiful day and get in your car and you hit I-25 or I-70 and you're stuck and you're frustrated and you see the off-ramps but you can't get to them, and even if you can, for some reason, you're just not moving that direction. You know what you need to do. The day's not over. You have things to do. You know where you are, and you know where you want to go, but you're stuck. A lot of our students are the same way. They're in our classrooms. They know the material. They know where they want to go, and we keep them in gridlock. The more we can integrate in our passion areas, history and social studies, science, the arts, and integrate the reading and the math, which are also very engaging. I don't mean to imply that. But they're not the passion courses that kids get hooked into. I was a principal um, before I came to Holstrom for the last four years in Greeley at Shashin Elementary. We talked about what hooks kids. Shashin is nothing like Holstrom. 64% for in reduced. In any other district, we'd probably be a Title I school, but in Greeley, we, we weren't. Um, a 50-50 population, incredible kids. My first night there, when I met the kids at back to school night, I said to the staff at our first staff meeting, shame on you. These kids are intelligent. Why are we not raising the bar? Why do we keep them in gridlock? And so we started doing more pre-assessments. We started integrating more. And if you follow District 6, to their credit, they've done some incredible things with second language learners and special ed kids. But they've also gone to a very prescribed instruction. With my background, my answer to the staff was, we take our passion areas, because if you weren't reading at grade level, in Greeley, you weren't allowed to take science or social studies at the elementary level. I wasn't OK with that. So we found the passion areas, and we integrated all these things. So kids got science in their reading time. 
Kids got social studies in their reading time. We put interventions in place that were just right. And we got our art, music, PE, and librarian involved as much as possible with every lesson that was happening. So it was fully integrated. We ended gridlock. There's lots of things that have happened in history. When Sputnik happened, it really was the first call for gifted education in the United States for acceleration in advanced academics. We've had civil rights and special ed, AYP and No Child Left Behind, race to the top. And finally, waiting for Superman. In many ways, all of these things are outstanding mandates. But like many things, they're unfunded mandates. And what's happened, I'm going to jump forward and then I'll come back, is it's caused unintended consequences. So what I mean by that is, the more standardized we become, the lower our scores have dropped. The more standardized we've become, the more creativity is lost from our kids. The unintended consequence is we've told teachers, you're not doing your job, so here's a script to tell you how to do your job. When I hear waiting for Superman, I look out in the room and I say, Superman's sitting right here. You're sitting right here. But when you have mandates that tell you, we've got to do this for the sake of a standardized test, the fear factor goes up. The, the uh, um, real estate prices, et cetera, unintended consequences. And as Americans who are trying to be the top nation in the world, instead we continue to have the bar raised, or lowered, I'm sorry. So I told the Greeley staff, I don't ever want to hear you say, close the gap again. It's, it's, it's a bad phrase. Instead, we're going to raise the mean. Every kid in our building, I didn't care where they were from, I didn't care what color they were. We treated like they were the next Thomas Edison, by the way. It's his birthday today, Thomas Edison. What a great day. Raise the mean. And we started the conversation of engagement, to engage kids so that they were hooked, that they wanted to be at school through inquiry. If you're, if you're familiar with the international baccalaureate programs in the schools, I've never been a principal of an IB school, but I love the philosophy. So I pull a lot. That's a good thing about educators. We can steal everything and not get in trouble. So I'm a really good thief. And I stole the philosophy of inquiry and higher level thinking. Getting the kids to say answers that were beyond that first level of comprehension. I wanted up an application. I wanted them finding the answers. No more coddling, no more hand-holding, through integration. The first person I went to, my technology person, my librarian, here's what we need to start doing. We started data meetings with classroom teachers and with specialists. We looked at kids where they were in reading, and we pulled in sources. We looked at where kids were in math, and we found the right intervention. We did the same thing with writing. And we pulled in technology as much as we possibly can. If you've ever been into District 6, you know that they're not real well known for their technology, which is unfortunate because in an age of where we have to have kids ready, that's not always going to happen. We stepped up the rigor. We made things experiential. And we picked up the pace. I gave every teacher a jar of paste picani sauce and said, Stop talking so they'll learn. Pick up the pace with acceleration. Build relationships with the kids. 
I gave teachers time to plan and be prepared so they knew what was coming up in their units that cycled, and they knew if their kids, through relationships, they could meet the kids' needs. I mentioned interventions already as well as extensions. We built, worked really hard on building vocabulary with kids. And we had Promethean boards, but many of us have smart boards in our buildings. We had as many kids using those as we could. Instant engagement and hands-on learning. And the ultimate goal was, oh, of course, sorry. <laughs> that was faux pas. Um, we, of course we need standards. I don't mean to say standards are not important. We absolutely have to have standards, but we should have every kid exceed those standards, no matter where they are. And now I'll say, because the ultimate goal truly is a passion for learning. So I didn't put together a big data. It's just to think. My presentation is to get you to think. And I encourage you to truly visit with your colleagues in your building and in your district and make sure that these things are at the forefront. Appreciate your time. Thank you.